All right, folks, uh, welcome today. Um, I'll be your uh, cyber weatherman for uh, January 27th, 2022 on this awesome summit. Uh, we already had the great keynote by uh, Rebecca. Uh, thanks as well, Rebecca, oh, it was awesome. Um, today, I'm gonna talk a bit about forecasting and how does that apply in the private sector. Now, usually uh, people think that forecasting is some abstract uh, uh, art. Um, in, in reality, it's not really that, right? Um, the reality is that it's actually something that is a practice and something you can actually do. And what a CTI analyst does is they don't predict, they actually forecast. Somebody told that a few summits ago, right? Um, and what this actually provides for you as a company or as a person is that it allows you to actually have some foresight into your strategic planning process. As a given example of that, I'd like to highlight some research by Paul Kobe and Maria Moreau, where they actually gave, uh, gave an example of a company who by using these intelligence analysis techniques, who they used actually to prepare themselves accordingly for the beginning phases of the, of the, of the, of the pandemic. And what actually allowed them to do is they actually saved a lot of costs in the process. Now, basically in the weather analogy, you know, um, when with a certain forecast, you would know what to wear. And in business, we actually use that understanding for uncertain futures to actually prepare ourselves accordingly to that. Now, I'm a, a, give it a short TLDR, I'm a, a security professional who is actually passionate about looking at the big picture. I want to understand how the big picture works and then how we can dive into each individual topics. Um, and I also think it's very important to share knowledge and expertise. And I'm also more than happy and, and really thrilled that I see a lot of new speakers uh, for the next two days in the conference. I really encourage everyone to actually uh, sign up for these as well. It's really awesome and I'd love to hear all of your thoughts. Uh, but I actually, th that being said, I actually don't have a background within the intelligence community. I, uh, unlike other people you see in these summits, in this summit specifically, I consider myself a practitioner who uses intelligence techniques, CTI techniques, and actually make that work in the private sector. That's what I'm good at. That's what I love to do. So I'll keep doing that. So I basically structured my talk about three things. So first I'd like to uh, give a few uh, basics, if you will, on how you use forecasting in the private sector. Second, I'll be diving into what value it actually adds. And thirdly, if you're really up for that, you know, what are some of the building blocks you need to actually do this? Let, let's start uh, with uh, some concepts uh, to, to get the, the juices flowing, if you will. Um, obviously there's prediction, right? And forecasting is actually a sub-element of prediction. Prediction is basically having a, 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 a possible outcome and actually figuring out what that is. And forecasting includes current and historic information to actually give you more insight into what could happen. Usually being, <coughs> apologies, more accurate. Now, there's also the concept of super forecasting. And super forecasting basically is uh, have a bunch of people do forecasts and analyze the forecasts and analyze the forecasters. That's really awesome. Um, there's a book uh, on that by Philip E. Tedlock, and it basically emphasizes uh, their research in the so called Good Judgment Project. And a fun anecdote of that research is that the average forecast uh, done is no different than a completely random thing and they uh, compare that to a dark throwing chimp. Now, finally, I'd like to uh, highlight the concept also sometimes referenced as now casting. And now casting basically looks at the current or very close future. Uh, and in the cyber field, we sometimes call this dashboarding, for example, right? So these are uh, a couple of, of basics we really need to understand. Now, the second thing we need to understand is who actually does this, right? So we, we all have that, that uncle or aunt that in the Christmas period had a lot of crazy ideas about what's going to happen in the near future. However, I generally think that there is no one type of group or anything that does this kind of work. I generally think that there are two use cases people try to explore when doing forecasting, which is basically the manual effort or the automated effort. 
Let's dive into that one a bit further. Uh, and but using an example. So if we would have a coin toss game, and in that coin toss game, we would have people predict or forecast, forecast what it will be if the coin is flipped, heads or tails. Now, what you will see, uh, and this is actually also an example from the super forecasting book, is that a few people do it really badly, and a few people do it really well, but the majority actually is 50-50. Is, is and it basically creates a normal distribution. And what it actually is, you know, you think maybe, you know, this is a coin toss game, this could be luck. <clears throat> but the reality is, is that in the private sector, it is actually a skill you can hone and work on. And that allows you to then move more to the right and more to the very good guesser area. So you have actually two main types, qualitative and quantitative. Quantitative breaks down into time series analysis and projection and causal models. The time series analysis and projection is basically uh, full of data and uh, the charting we all know and love, right? And the causal models are actually is the same thing, except that underneath there are certain relationships noted. This basically allows them to predict when something will happen, like rain is going to fall, if that happens, if, if the cloud is coming here. Now, finally, you have the qualitative aspect, focusing on the human judgment on that. And this is regularly used if you don't have sufficient data or if you, for example, need to fill in some gaps. Um, <clears throat> so let me now also, so you now got, got the gist of it, right? Um, and now let me also dive a bit deeper into this topic and actually see you know, what actually is useful in the private sector. As you can see on this, this visual is that uh, you can see the three types uh, I defined, but you can al already notice that the more on the right is actually more technically oriented, whereas on the left is more people oriented. Um, I generally think that, uh, that <laughs> I, I obviously have an, an opinion on that. Uh, and my practical take is actually that a lot of people want to have the more technologically oriented solution. But the reality is it comes with some challenges. You need to have your data correctly, uh, clean data, uh, relationships defined. Uh, th that's a lot of work, right? Um, and uh, what I generally see uh, in real life is that uh, uh, basically the best results I get is from using a qualitative approach uh, and then combine that, uh, support that with certain uh, uh, techniques from time series and analysis based on the data you might have. So let's explore that best value thing a bit further. Now, Bex already mentioned a bit on structured analytical techniques, um, and I uh, want to highlight this as well. And, and this, uh, the idea of, of, of this is basically a debiasing technique that can help an analyst provide more options to what they're doing. Uh, it is the soup du jour of intelligence analysts, and they do this every day. And in general, uh, I think uh, these are still in the private sector and uh, not used very often. Um, you basically can group them on the purpose, or if you're a purist, there are several other categories. Uh, diagnostic being uh, obviously looking at the current situation, making analytical arguments. Contrarian uh, uh, thinking would be at challenging the current thinking, and imaginative would look into, uh, for example, developing new insights. Uh, my key takeaway here is that you should not basically think of this as the go-to way, but there's a lot of fundamental logic behind this. And that's why I always use these as a sort of like a spirit guide or a toolbox, which I then look into and then think, you know, I'll grab the book here and think, okay, I'll use this workflow to determine what use case I have, and then also think about how I actually need to use it, right? That's what everyone uh, always thinks about. Now, that being said, um, I would also like to emphasize how you use this. So here you see a 10-step uh, uh, guide on how you can use one of these techniques, and I specifically highlighted the scenario planning one. I'm not going to go through each and every one of these. We don't have that much time, um, but I would like to, so I really like, would like to recommend all of you to actually look at this slide tomorrow again and think, hey, this is something useful for me. I can use this, yes or no. I'd like to highlight three things. 
The first one is, is that using the technique as is, is definitely not the purpose. It's also about the process. When you actually do this, periodically, um, it will actually help you in the whole, it will actually help the whole company. And why is that? Because people will recognize that you do these kind of exercises, that you will actually have something to show for. It. Second is the analysis. In this particular example, you see that there's actually a lot of work being done to understand on a very granular level what is going on. So that is also needed. And finally, you will have a, the end product. And that's sometimes also underestimated. What should the end product look like? But also, um, how can you make the end product relatable for different members in the team? That is something I'll get back on uh, later in this presentation. So you just saw an example how you do the full process, right? Um, but in that process, there's the analytical steps. And after you've done that, you actually, your conclusion actually allows you to make assessments. And these assessments are really useful in forecasting because they substantiate the uncertainty. And what I mean by that is that they allow you to have a better understanding of what's going on or what's, what do you think that will happen. In the context of forecasting, I would like to emphasize one thing I found really useful, and that is moving assessments upwards. Um, what, that, what I mean by that is that you actually have a certain situation and you see the key takeaways from that. And if you monitor that on a monthly and quarterly basis, you can actually see a flow of events happening and create some sort of better understanding of you. And to give an example on that, uh, in uh, Q4 21, we actually saw certain infrastructure providers uh, having some downtime, right? But in the end, uh, from a daily basis, people ask me like, why is this relevant? But then when we started tracking that, and on a monthly basis, we saw that this wasn't the first time it happened. And you know, it, it continued to happen. And on a quarterly basis, we were actually able to say like, this is something, there's, there must be something going on because this can't all be the intern, right? So another thing that's quite relevant is, and you don't see often, is looking at the meta. And I don't mean the Zuckerberg uh, Facebook policy of rebranding. I'm talking about comparing comparative research and thinking about, okay, how can we uh, overlap certain researches? How can we combine them or not? And this is really useful if you don't have that much time to do analysis and actually allow you to seek out certain vendors or individuals who do that. It allows you to actually spot pros and cons and publishers who may be really good at that. And that can support your source and collection management if you're doing that exactly. Also, the nature of that type of research allows you to identify trends because it's comparative by nature. And finally, um, you also will see different things overlapping and that's useful for uh, uh, improving the structure of your deliverables. Now I'm gonna shamelessly plug a talk I gave last year uh, where I actually looked at what were the threat predictions in 2021? Uh, and actually, at the mid of the year, what actually turned out uh, and, and how I predicted or forecasted that to happen in the, in the, in the near future. Um, it's interesting for those of you who are, who are into this topic, if you're interested in that, have a, have a look at that. So now we get into the, uh, the big elephant in the room, right? Um, the reality is, is that forecasting does take people and these people need to have a certain skill. So they probably also need some sort of training, right? And it actually takes some time to do this correctly. Um, and finally, you might not even like the conclusions um, or find them valuable. And this could be that you don't think it's accurate enough, right? But the reality is that forecasting you use to actually develop certain options for you and think about those options and allow you to actually prepare and work on that. Now, despite, despite the obvious, um, there are real, no real shortcuts on that. And there are no real things you can do quickly. So give me a second. So this, this morning I had the idea, the, the weather is fine, but the reality was is that it's Netherlands and it was raining. So, that forecast was a bit off. But to prepare your team actually on doing forecasting, there's a couple of things they can actually do right now. And I'm gonna to talk to that uh, on that in a second. So the first thing you would really need is to actually align on risk management. 
some of you might think, ah, risk management again. I actually found that this is an important step to begin with. And why, to be honest? Because this is basically where we make the conscious decision to do something about something. That being said, um, I also believe that forecasting is a decision, uh, is a risk management decision, right? And it doesn't matter what equation you use. It matters that you have to have an understanding of certain uh, uh, elements. And there's a link for, for example, for cyber intelligence, which I believe is in the capability, intent, and opportunity domain. And one of the things I usually do when I'm having these discussions, I try to find a common ground with people. And actually, for example, try to align with risk management teams on their data level. This could be MITRE's attack, could be something completely different. Now, the second building block you need is talking a common language. And more importantly, being able to, to uh, nuance or, or be more granular in the language you talk. That's probably early in the conference. So if those of you who are using the bingo cards, check it off, um, right? Because uh, this one is on probably on there. But uh, what I generally found is that you need to establish some sort of ladder uh, of, of how you frame your story. So I always expand the pyramid with the, the narrative of that there are certain groups that are influenced by a certain motivation. They uh, uh, perform certain campaigns and each campaign can have certain TTPs and observables. And what is important is that you have a conversation with your teams to understand what kind of tangible content do they need, or maybe they actually need some of the more uh, yeah, uh, uh, fluffy content, basically. And the second thing, this also allows me to then work on uh, integrating capability and intent. And a small disclaimer there, uh, obviously, if you don't have an, a, a big intelligence capability, then working on intent is very hard. And I would even say that in the private sector, it's near impossible to have a, you know, high confidence assessments on intent. I think that's nearly impossible. But it does help you, both of these, all of these elements allow you to ask better questions. Now on that note, I'd like to uh, uh, emphasize a bit a thing here, saying uh, the art of asking questions. So I often see people asking the questions of, are we secure or not? But generally speaking, we should actually break that down a bit. And what, what especially for forecasting, Be why? Because we then are able to develop some sort of hypotheses, which we can also test and verify. And in the example you're seeing here, I use Bayesian question clustering to actually break a certain topic down. And the point of the matter is, is that in the end, you're able to actually not just say we are secure, but you can also say we are secure because of ABC and this for now and this for the future. The next thing we actually should look at is that it also comes at a cost. And that was also a thing highlighted in the elephant in the room. Now, this example is uh, uh, from a 1971 uh, research journal, which basically compared uh, qualitative methods together. And what I find hilarious and entertaining at the same time is that th these things are still pretty relevant. So one of the things I generally think that uh, drive up cost or influence costs are two things. Uh, the first one being accuracy. Um, you actually need people and skill to do that and uh, to actually work with that. And that, that causes you to actually have a lot of uh, efforts to put into that. Now, a second thing is the, uh, the time associated with that, obviously, but also the automation on that and any computation you might need. Obviously, this is an example of 50 years ago, so $2,000 is probably way more now uh, 50 years later. Um, but I, I think the, the essence is, is in this is that there's always a technology element related to, for example, the data you use. Now, that being said, um, I, 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 there's a lot, in my opinion, there's a lot of misconception on uh, uh, the role technology plays in forecasting. And I strongly believe that the, you should be very wary about uh, uh, forecasting projects which have a large emphasis on the technological bit. They're very co cost uh, heavy uh, on that, but you also have to take into account that there usually is also a human needed to enter the data, maybe cleanse the data, for example. And those are some of these small and practical things you don't see often in project plans. 
Another building block we need is actually a point of reference to tell our story. So I actually been, been talking about this concept for a few years, uh, but I generally found it to be really uh, efficient to talk about scenarios and especially how they relate to them and how, how does that work over time. Uh, I usually uh, think that this is part of the end product of a exercise and you just have to find a good way to do that. Um, and last year in the, in, in the same CTI summit, I also uh, uh, did a, like a, a call to action for everyone to explore a, in their qualitative research to explore further, how can they move towards um, machine readable content? And I think this call to action still stands. And I would like to seriously invite every one of you to collaborate on this basically problem. And, I, and over the last few months, we already saw some initiatives happening on that. And per today, I'd like to add one initiative to that. So I'm now open sourcing my scenario format, which you can get on the link, which is shown on screen. And that allows you to then, when you do these kind of exercises, at least have a more or less a story format that you can use to then map your scenarios on. So for example, if you've done a certain breakdown of a certain geopolitical event, right? Uh, you then figure out what kind of steps will be happening. <clears throat> And you can use this kind of content to then map that and present that to your stakeholders. Very useful stuff. I really encourage you to look into this. Finally, um, one uh, building block we really need, in my opinion, is actually tracking and monitoring. I would like, uh, personally, I, I love the, uh, the YouTube conspiracy videos. I, I, I find them uh, very entertaining. And one of them I actually really uh, adore is the one from New Rockstars. And what they basically do, <clears throat> they uh, look into uh, different elements of, for example, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and then dive into theories and conspiracies and what could happen and what indicators that could be. And I find that so cool. And, and what I really enjoy is that they also, every year, they do a what did we do wrong session. And they use it in a very fun way where they basically also uh, shame the presenter a bit. Uh, and I think, I think that's awesome. You know, humor always works. And the reality is, is that um, we actually, in cybersecurity, we need more of that. We, we don't see that often, right? People saying, hey, we got that wrong. I would like to call out every vendor right now and say, hey, you know, you made some predictions, but what did you make? What of the predictions were that you made last year and how did they fare? What did you think and what changed, for example? And this goes for that kind of deliverables, but this also goes internally for your own uh, analysis you actually do. So this means, for example, if you on a daily basis look at doing assessments, <clears throat> you need to establish a sort of like a way to look back at those assessments and monitor if they were correct or not. Finally, that also helps you to do some comparison. And actually, this could actually be a cool team building exercise as well, where you actually give a prize to the individual that is really good at this kind of thing. Now, that is actually what I have for you today. The, the basics, and those are extremely important. You really need the basics to get going, all right? Um, this could be as simple as aligning on a data level. It could be as simple as talking the same language. But more importantly, you actually need to give this the priority it needs. It doesn't, uh, uh, I see often that people actually don't do, take the time to do these kind of analysis. And that is, you know, that is obviously up to, up to those individuals. But I have generally found that if you give it the priority it deserves, you can actually reap the benefits. Now, I also mentioned, for example, this, that these, uh, using these techniques is not something new, right? And even in the summit, we've been talking about this for a very long time. So for example, in 2017, we had Rob Dardnall talk about it. In 2018, we have our Rick Howard talk about it. In 2019, we have uh, Amy Baitlick talk about it. Today, we have already Rebecca highlighting this. I think this is a topic where we will continue to explore further how we can you know, use the simple basics of that and use that in our daily lives. And I'd like to really stress that you know, even though these are small steps, 
you know, these are huge steps in the, in the private sector. Contemplate these three things today, figure out how they work for you. And if you really then think, okay, I want to get my hands dirty on this forecasting stuff, working talked about, then I have three things I think you should be looking into. For example, start planning your next scenario exercise uh, and actually look into how you're going to do that. Uh, wh what are the steps I need to do? Um, people will recognize the value of that and also collaborate with you on it. Take a moment to actually do the analysis, give it the time it deserves. <clears throat> And finally, if you, if you have your own structure, fine, that's great. Um, but if you need something or if you need a certain structure to actually work with, you know, have a look at the stuff that's presented in this, uh, in this slide deck and you can actually use that at your uh, disposal. So that's it what I have for you today um, uh, on this uh, beautiful day, the 27th of January. Uh, for those of you looking at the slides, I also added in the, in the back a reference list of all the things I note, uh, noted today, um, but also some of the maybe YouTube videos you like to explore further, books you like to look into. And feel free to have some questions in the Slack uh, conversation afterwards. Cheers.